right, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Society of Academic Emergency Medicine's Research Learning Series. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, randomized controlled trials, which is kind of like the epitome of our research. So that's really wonderful. My name is Josh Davis. I'm an emergency medicine physician in Wichita, Kansas. We have a wonderful panel here for you. Um, so first of all, we have um, Dr. Nicholas Caputo. He's an attending physician and physician advisor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at New York City Lincoln Medical Center in the South Bronx, currently assistant Associate Professor of Clinical Emergency Medicine at the Weill Medical College of Cornell University and an attending emergency physician at Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York Presbyterian Hospital. Oh my God, that's a mouthful. A Director of Urgent Care and Home Services for Atria Concierge uh, Service in Manhattan, board certified in emergency medicine. He actually did an internship in general surgery at Beth Israel Medical Center in Manhattan and then his residency training in emergency medicine at New York City Lincoln Medical Center, where he served as chief, chief resident and also fellowship training in critical care and retrieval medicine at Royal Darwin Hospital in Darwin in Australia. Uh, Dr. Caputo is widely published in emergency medicine. His research looks at the evidence behind the conventional wisdom practice in emergency departments across the world in order to determine the efficacy of current management strategies in order to improve safety quality outcomes for patients, including RSI, apneic oxygenation, occult shock, he focuses joint on medical pathology, socioeconomic disparities. He serves as a major in the United States Army, currently assigned the 947th Forward Resuscitative and Surgical Team based in West Hartford, Connecticut. He returns from a deployment in Somalia with the Joint Special Operations Task Force and in support of the Naval Special Army Warfare and the Navy SEALs. Wow, that makes me look pretty boring. Dr. Dr. Catherine Staten is an emergency professor in emergency medicine and neurosurgery and global health at tenure at Duke University director of the Gemini, the Global EM Innovation and Implementation Research Center, and the Emergency Medicine Vice Chair of Research Strategy and Faculty Development. Her research integrates the innovative implementation methods into health systems globally to improve access to acute care. In 2012, uh, with an injury registry in Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, Dr. Staten developed, demonstrated 30% of injury patients had high-risk alcohol use, um, and so that allowed her to get her K1, and she's now being trialed in an NIAAA-funded R01, Pragmatic Adaptive Trial. She's designed and managed multiple clinical trials globally and in the United States from efficacy trials to pragmatic trials and hybrid implementation trials. So I think that insight will be very helpful for us today. And then we have Dr. Will Moyer, Professor of Emergency Medicine and Neurology at the University of Michigan. He serves as a medical statistical scientist for Barry Consultants. His work is to improve the care with patients with neurologic disease through his work on acute stroke uh, and in research. His work in the field focused on the design of clinical trials with adaptive and flexible components. In addition, he's principal investigator of an NINDS clinical trials methodology course and a co-investigator in the clinical uh, sirens network at one of the coordinating centers. He's funded by NIH. He's a co-investigator on the stroke net trials underway in the Michigan Regional Coordinating Center. Formerly served as the emergency medical director of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Stroke Center. And the, he is the principal investigator of NIH trials, including text messaging for hypertension and a cluster randomized trial to improve the patient care of patients with acute dizziness, my favorite complaint. He is a national PI of 50 plus site, 1800 trial of cardiac arrest and hypothermia, and another, another trial on uh, pediatric cardiac arrest with 40 plus sites. So we have lots of great expertise here to talk about randomized controlled trials. I'm gonna start with just a brief overview of uh, kind of the background for randomized controlled trials and emergency medicine. So I'm going to share my screen here for a short PowerPoint we are not going to be doing very much of this. I really want to give the experts a chance to discuss. So this is our kind of panel that we have today. Randomized controlled trials are um, currently the gold standard for answering research questions. I think most people kind of realize that. The goal of the randomized trial is to reduce the bias. Uh, so we use randomization and controls and trials. So all of the three uh, important words to reduce the bias. And we have some blinding. And then the goal is to have the sample population result the future target population. So really the epitome of uh, finding causation and improving outcomes in research trial and reducing bias. Randomized trials, so we randomize them to minimize selection bias and confounding. So this overcomes some of the problems with observational trials. And we control with, uh, you can either use control as placebos or kind of the standard of care outcome. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the discussion today about the pros and cons of you using both of those and getting um, IRB approval and things that go along with that. And then the blinding, there's lots of options for blinding. There's the single blind where the researcher and, um, doesn't know uh, what treatment they receive. We can do double blind where the participant and the physician or researcher don't know. And that again, reduces the risk of bias, which is the whole point of using the randomized control trial is to 
give us questions that give us in a well controlled experimental setting, which improves which treatments improve uh, outcomes based on the study design. There's a couple different kinds of general study design, some of which you heard me talk about in these uh, panelist bios. So there's parallel group, which is the most common, which is two groups. One gets uh, one treatment and one gets the control treatment. There's crossover trials. So where one group starts in one group, each, each group starts with a treatment arm and then they, uh, they switch the treatment arms. So one of the most well-known studies of this is probably the fluid trial that were done a couple of years ago, the SALT-ED trial, and I forget the name of the other one. And then the cluster randomized trial. So basically, you, instead of randomizing patients or individuals, you randomize a group. That also was done with the kind of uh, SALT-ED and the fluids trial, looking at the kind of balanced solution. So they took several emergency departments and they grouped the emergency departments into randomization. So each emergency department was giving a certain fluid and then they crossed over to the and they crossed them over to give the other preferred fluid. And then there's the factorial trials, which are people get multiple interventions at one time. I think the COVID trials are probably the most kind of well known for these. So the active trials, there's one through six or eight, whatever they're on now, for kind of looking at different combinations of treatments and uh, using statistics to analyze the outcomes. So we're going to move on to our panelist discussion now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to start with some questions, but this is really designed to be uh, interactive. So if anybody has any questions, they either want to unmute and or put in the chat. I would much rather ask the questions that you as the audience want to hear more so than hearing my voice. I do like the sound of my voice, but um, I would much rather hear my voice saying your questions that you unanswered. But I'm going to have everyone kind of unmute uh, temporarily uh, as far as the panelists and maybe just give us like a one liner about yourself and what you do outside of medicine or what you do for fun. Dr. Staten, do you want to go first? Sure. So what do I do outside of medicine as I travel? Strangely enough, that's why I'm a global health person. It makes total sense. Um, I'm currently doing a PhD in Brazil just because I don't have enough to do on my plate. Um, and I do triathlons because I like waking up at four o'clock in the morning. You really put me to shame here. Adding all that onto that long bio, my goodness. Uh, Dr. Caputo, how about you? Yeah, so outside of uh, medicine, I'm I'm a water person, so I like uh, scuba diving, surfing, but also I'm a, a motorcycle uh, rider, uh, avid. And and one of my colleagues at the concierge service I, I work at, because sometimes I take my Ducati on house calls, uh, gave me the nickname Dr. Ducati. So whenever he needs a house call for some of his patients, he'll say, I'm sending Dr. Ducati. The members love it. Uh, so I, in terms of outside of medicine, I'm not I don't travel as to as many fancy places, but or interesting different places. But I did do my first triathlon like three weeks ago, which is great. Swimming was my weak point. I was in 84th place out of 99 on the swim, but 11th on the bike. So it was a stronger, stronger, stronger thing. And then you know, 30th on the run. But me and my family are also, I have four kids ranging from eight to 17. And all of us are involved in musical theater in some way, along with my wife. So my wife and my youngest are in the music man in 10 days or so. So, so like musical theater, got love visiting New York to see Broadway. Awesome. That's really cool. Really nice to hear what everyone kind of likes to do. So we're going to go back a little bit and have everyone talk a little bit about their research focus. I am going to, this is supposed to be kind of rapid fire. I know that you all have dedicated your lives to these and can probably talk for hours and hours about it, but if you can maybe give us a, a couple kind of sentence background on kind of what your research is, why why you maybe chose that topic or how you ended up in that topic. And then maybe your kind of, how you ended up doing kind of randomized trials and got kind of to the, to the kind of that far along in your kind of research career. Uh, Dr. Caputo, you want to go first on this one? Sure, no problem. So my research interest basically focused on conventional wisdom and really task what we do and have been doing in emergency medicine over the past 50 to 60 years. This has led me to do randomized trials on things such as apneic oxygenation, pre-oxygen, looking at n tidal O2 and how do we objectively measure pre-oxygen and what we're doing in rapid sequence intubation. You know, a lot of these things that we've done have been extrapolated from other specialties, anesthesia, surgery, and we've kind of just picked up the ball and ran with it. Um, without really an evidence-based approach and how it fits our patient population in the emergency department. And, you know, it's been eye-opening for me because, you know, you find out that a lot of things that we practice just by conventional wisdom, they might pan out in like an observational trial, but when you look at it from a randomized perspective, it, it, it doesn't really show efficacy. And so I like looking at trials that are pragmatic, but also practical, that are going to have impact at the bedside and that are grounded in true clinical interactions. So like, you know, the problems that I face on a day-to-day -day basis in the emergency department are the same problems that every other ER doctor faces. If you can find solutions to those problems, you have true impact. All right, wonderful. Dr. Moyer? 
Yeah, so I would say, you know, I came to Michigan to do a stroke fellowship, which was not actually my idea. I wanted to do a research fellowship, but they're like, why don't you do a stroke fellowship? So then that led me to really focus on the early care of people with some form of a neurologic problem. So my 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 interest is in finding neurons that might die and keeping them from dying. And, you know, that's at various different levels, you know, whether it's my hypertension study, like preventing your stroke, whether it's studies that focus on dizziness, like finding the rare dizziness cases that actually have strokes and not, you know, other more less sinister forms of, of dizziness. And then the cardiac arrest trials, which are, are focused on getting as many of those neurons to choose not to die and allow the person to wake up and have a good neurologic outcome. Clinical trials um, have been a real interest. And I wanted to actually at one point wanted to do a K on, do, on designing Bayesian adaptive trials, um, but it turns out it was it, it didn't it didn't work out. But we we got a, a U01 grant where we designed various clinical trials, and I got to be the junior person on that. And I had the good fortune to just be in the right place at the right time a lot. And that was where we designed the, the currently ongoing ice cap trial and its its child, the pediatric ice cap trial. So that involved uh, a lot of a lot of being in the being in the right place at the right time. But really, an interest in I, I did a master's in clinical research and. and statistical analysis right after I was doing my fellowship. So I was I had a passion for applied analysis, but even learning more advanced methods. So it was really neat to be in the room as we design these things and be able to kind of work with top-notch biostatisticians, but also top-notch clinicians who do research. And then I've run this clinical trials course for the Neurologic Institute, NINDS, for the past several years, which has been really fun, although it's now kind of in a renewal phase where, where we're looking to kind of come up with the next version of that. But that's been a project-based course where I, one of my passions is really helping people think through how to answer questions that matter, but answer them in a way that you can actually use the results. Wow. So you definitely have a lot of expertise there and, and God bless you for taking on the weak and dizzy 90-year-old in a research trial that, that we all need that. Uh, Dr. Staten, how about you? Yeah, so I started out um, in global health knowing that I wanted to do research because there's not a lot of evidence base that's appropriate for low resource settings. Um, and I started to travel and, and do global health work, and I didn't know how to teach and train our colleagues globally. Um, and so I figured research was the way to do that. Um, but then as, as I started to look at our data, a lot of our interventions are not applicable in our low resource settings, right? So it usually starts out with get the CAT scan and do something. I'm like, I don't have a CAT scan. So what do I do? And so it's got me into a direction of saying, okay, well, we have to create interventions that are truly resource appropriate and applicable at the bedside. And we have to do it in very pragmatic ways using evidence from other locations so that it can immediately get to the bedside. So while I started out with sort of trauma and trauma registries that grew into alcohol being the largest risk for trauma globally with little to no interventions or little to no treatment options, created interventions that we give in the emergency department in Tanzania. And then that moved on to adaptive clinical trials. So we can answer more than one question successfully, successively, and hopefully getting to something that we can implement and disseminate rapidly. So our five-year trial, hopefully we'll be able to lead right into a dissemination trial, which will be exciting. And then starting to think about that for those who have limited access globally. So not just Tanzania, but hopefully soon in Brazil as well. Wow, that's so great. And you mean to tell me there's places where they do emergency medicine without CAT scans? I, I'm... <laughs> strangely enough, strangely enough. Uh, so I'm going to leave a, just a, a couple seconds of awkward silence where I can have the audience, maybe if you want to unmute and ask a question and or type a question in the chat, because like I said, I really want y'all's questions to be answered here. I have plenty of questions and could go for, for plenty of time for my own interests, but I'd, I'd like to get everyone else's input. So we will have a minute of awkward silence unless anybody has one. Oh. Hi, so my name is Karen. I'm the research director at University Hospitals in Cleveland Medical Center. We are definitely growing our research program and actually just got enrolled as a site in an American Heart Association trial. And I, I'm more of a health services researcher. So, I mean, I am the PI by proxy, but because there's literally not many PIs in our department. Um, but yes, I have lots of questions probably as well as Josh. Um, I think the two things that, like, I think the first thing is, how do you kind of get your foot in that door, particularly for those networks? Like, Will, you mentioned Siren. Right? There was some, you know, like we applied to be a spoke on the like Cincinnati Siren Hub and that kind of, you know, fell through. But how do you kind of get your foot in that door for those networks? Because I think that could be something to help us grow. 
And then the budget always really confuses me because it's not like my line item FTE that I'm used to. Um, and it just kind of throws me for a loop. So those are my two kind of initial questions. I'm sure there will be many more to come. Okay. I think you, you invoked me a bit. So cool. Like I, I used to live, live in Cleveland. I was thinking, I was thinking of my day I, when you're like, what's it like to not have a CAT scan? It's like, well, back when Lakewood Hospital was a hospital when I was a resident, <laughs> And I was moonlighting there. They didn't have a CAT scanner one day, but they and they didn't even have EMS divert head trauma patients. And I was like, what do you want me to do with this head trauma patient? Anyway, but you know, that's not the answer to your question. So it's interesting. So it, so the, the current trials that Siren has going, obviously some of them are, are pretty complicated and, and you have to have a bit of buy-in on, you know, ice cap. If you can convince your intensivists that cooling to 33 is good. And again, we don't want to have this whole talk be about that and have your site be really committed to that. Then I'd be really interested to talk to you about being a site in, in ice cap. The but again, you know, and, and I have many, many, many friends in your department. So I'm probably pretty easy to get in touch with. We don't want to like monopolize this call because not every site in America has a bunch of my friends working at it. So I think in the Siren network, we have a flexible approach. We do have a hub and spoke model where hubs can work with a variety of spokes who aren't necessarily just in the same town. And, and that gives some flexibility. There's some resources in terms of project management from those sites, in terms of, of helping the, the spoke sites sort of get some mentorship and understand their, their research coordinators and, and, and local PIs how to, how to set things up. So I think there are those opportunities, but if it's, it's more a matter of, you know, is one of the trials that we're doing currently something that you know, falls into your plate? You know, we're doing a TBI trial as well. It's a little tricky though, it's called Boost 3. But we only have, you know, ice cap I can kind of do anywhere that's willing to cool patients. But Boost 3, we only have a limited number of Moberg data collection devices that we can deploy throughout the country. So it's like, it's very choosy um, in terms of, of whether we could get you involved in that study. But we have new studies that we're working to develop. You know, ice cap has a, has a follow-up study post ice cap where we're, we're collecting long-term outcomes on cardiac arrest patients. So there are these opportunities. In terms of the budgeting aspect, it's really, you know, being a good, you know, being a good site in a multi-center trial, that was a really good experience for me back when I was doing one of the stroke trials, Clearer, that was run out of, of, out of Cincinnati, of figuring out how to, you know, if you get a bundled payment, like I get like $9,000 for an enrollment, how much goes to me, how much goes to my coordinator and so forth. But it's also, because it's an emergency trial, it's aspirational. You have to get some support from your department chair to say like, I need a piece of a coordinator I'm not going to make any money unless we recruit people into the study. So there is there is some risk for us. You have to sort of project, I can enroll four patients a year in ISCAP or, or, or some study like that, and then figure out how you mostly pay your research staff in those things. Unfortunately, in terms of the your local PI effort, it's hard to, you know, you, you're pretty expensive, whereas research coordinators are also expensive, but they do the real, real work for you. So I think at the risk of, I mean, I could, yeah, I could probably talk. I could probably talk 50 minutes about this, but um, I don't want to. I want to hear other voices too, because you don't all want to hear from me. But I think, you know, certainly if there, you know, I think you know, you have a very busy hospital that has a really unique and important population. So I think, depending on what, what things are going on in other networks as well, you know, just sort of, kind of introducing yourself, saying, hey, I'm interested in, in perhaps doing these studies. Sometimes going to the study websites and just saying, hey, we're interested. We we are. We are looking, we are, many of these places, are, almost all studies that are multi-center are looking for more sites, particularly sites that can be successful. Now it's, it's, you may not be successful in all diseases though, right? Like if, if you know, it, we don't have very many patients with sickle cell in Ann Arbor, unfortunately. So I wouldn't be a very successful site in that. We don't have that many patients with TBI. It's like, people are just like, not as mean to each other as they are in Cleveland, unfortunately. Um, no, we're super, we're but, but yeah, from a TBI perspective. So, okay. so anyway, knowing what you, what, knowing what you can offer to trials yeah. so that you, you, you plan yourself for success so that you can recruit and do well in something. But then there's also observational research. There's other opportunities. So I think trying to, but, but most of us are really eek and interested about things. So we, 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 sometimes I'm slow with email and I'm sorry, but like, just, just kind of try to reach out. We, we sometimes have mixers at like AM and those conferences where we invite people broadly from, from, from things kind of come to our stuff and learn about our, our, our ongoing things. No, that sounds great. I'll definitely reach out having, having, ch having chatted with you. And I think with the with the budget, like you said, it's it's the doubles in those details, right? Like if I get a big sum, 
you know, a thousand, ten thousand, something was we can pick like a round number, you know, again, like, is it the PI like a hundred? Is it, is it 1% of it? Is it 10% of it? Uh, you know, how do I translate my, my hours per week FTE kind of idea into that lump sum, knowing all of those other variables exist? I don't want to take something like you said from the research assistant who's doing a lot. We were involved in another trial that was like, in the emergency department, but cardiology was very much much involved and they kind of hijacked it, you know, and they were like, well, we're taking all of the, you know, the enrollment money and you're like, okay, but like, we're finding the patients for you. And so it was just, it was a lot of, like, I didn't know when, like, is there like a, a template out there or is there some sort of guide for how to break down an enrollment budget? No, but I think, <laughs> I, yeah, the short answer is no, but I guess in terms of those things where sometimes departments you know, it depends on what departments are bringing, right? Like if a lot of emergency medicine coordinators and staff are doing a lot of the work, then it would be unfair for cardiology to take all the money, right? Like, and and again, I can't tell you how to like, kind of every department of emergency medicine stands at a different spot within their institutions. But to some degree that, you know, hopefully there's a, a group of all of the research directors that you're, you're, you have a place at the table at to sort of say like, come on, like, and and I think another thing that we've we've sort of done at our shop is, you know, we we sort of, I mean, I guess not to be mean, but we like, in order to access our emergency department and have access to our patients, you do have to play nicely. So so that's sort of, and if they're not playing nicely to you, the research director, then it's like, okay, your the chairs need to kind of, kind of kind of because we can in emergency medicine we can typically be be bullied in many of these larger places by by medicine or 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 surgery departments that you know like like. You know, I know people look to the University of Michigan and say, gosh, you know, you, 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 you often are leading the country in NIH funding and so forth. But within our own institution, you know, we're like tied with family medicine and neurology, right? We're, we're, we're minor players within our institution, even though we're major players within our specialty. So I think you just try to be, try to be like as kind as possible. I guess the philosophical approach to the budgeting, I would say is you know, usually take a sort of honest approach is like, how many hours of work is this going to take the coordinator to do these things and say that like for a single enrollment, it's going to, you know, take them 10 hours to enter in all this data. It's going to, you know, there's going to be some startup activities. And then you, you do have to kind of make a business decision as to whether it's a good idea to do the study. You know, if it's, if it's, if it's good and you maybe can get some support from your chair or you have a, a friend who has a, you know, all of a research coordinator and they have some extra time, there's ways to get those things you know, you, you have to think about it, but you're right. It's, it can be, it can be hard to figure out, but a lot of it is, you know, bouncing off thing, bouncing things off other people knowing, you know, and again, if that has to be somebody in another department at your institution or somebody at a different institution, you know, again, I, th but there isn't like, there isn't like an easy, like set, like sort of menu of like, this is how you should divide up money. I would say generally it divides to uh, more for the research coordinators because you could, because they can do more like, we get so distracted as emergency physician faculty, right? It's like, oh, I got to do a shift today. Oh, I got to do this. So the more that, but but your your research program manager or research staff, they can bug the IRB every day about something, right? But you you're like, oh shit, I got like a hundred extra emails, like, and oh gosh, I've got five shifts, like I, I can't bug the email the IRB or contracts office every day. But your research staff can. So I think an emphasis on put more towards the research staff. Usually, unfortunately. That's the, that's, I guess, the simple version. Yeah, Josh, if I could just make a, a point, I don't want people to come away from this thinking that budgeting should restrict their ability to do randomized control trials. Most of the RCTs that I've either led or have taken part in have been unfunded. And there are workarounds for that. You know, when you're dealing with the IRB, I'm on my IRB at, at Lincoln. You know, I work in, in the public system. We don't get you know, hours protected down to do research. Um, we don't get research assistance. So some of the workarounds for that is to, you know, like when we're doing pragmatic practical studies that test usual care versus, you know, like say the app box, the endowed trial, we utilized our interns as sort of our research assistants and gave them checklists and said, all right, guys, if you want to learn how to intubate, like let's, let's get you in the mindset of, of intubating. So you're going to 
go through this checklist whenever we're going through an RSI. And within that checklist is embedded the data points that I want to get to get sort of uh, patients enrolled in the study. For our pre-ox trial, where we're looking at N-Title O2 as an objective measure, you know, we didn't have the money to go out and buy N-Title O2 monitors in the emergency department. So I went to anesthesia and I said, do you have extra monitors? And they said, yeah, here's a handful. So there's collaborative things that you could do when you're in a, you know, budget restricted environment, such as like a public hospital, or, or you're actually, you don't want to go through the, you know, the rigmarole of trying to get, you know, a grant or uh, an NIH funding. And so I just want people to understand that, that, you know, you don't have to let budget limit what you're going to do in terms of randomized control trials, because there's plenty of things out there that need to be studied. And a lot of them can be studied without a very complicated budgetary process. So I guess maybe speaking of that, when you're thinking about designing like a randomized trial, what are some of like the the first things that you think about, like in the very early stages, like when it's just like a, a bubble in your head kind of type thing, what are, what are the first things you need to think about? Yeah. So for me, it comes down to, you know, is the question really grounded in, in clinical interaction? Like, you know, and is what I am looking to study actually going to change how I practice at the bedside. And if it is, then I, I do like a, a ground up approach. So I'll look for, you know, retrospective studies on the topic, have any signal been teased out from those. And, and if not, then, hey, let's do an, uh, a retrospective study and see if, if there's signal within my cohort, right? And if there is, now let's do that prospect of observational study and see if the signal stays true. And if it does, all right, now I think we're ready to really put the effort towards doing a randomized control trial. I think it's difficult to just hop in and do a randomized control trial without really looking at, you know, is the question grounded in good clinical evidence? And is it, you know, as Catherine would say, pragmatic and practical? You know, the last thing you want to do is, is spend a ton of your time, especially if you're not being compensated for that time, working towards something that's going to have little impact or might not work out in the end. One of the lessons I learned early on was, you know, study what you see, not necessarily what you're interested in, right? So at Lincoln in the South Bronx, we see a lot of trauma. We do a lot of airway stuff. We don't get a lot of STEMIs. So I don't do a lot of, you know, cardiac research because it would take me forever to get those studies done. So I look at, you know, what do we see commonly? And then what are the issues with these, these sort of like pathologies and, and how can I come up with questions to help solve those, those issues? Yeah, I would completely uh, reiterate what you just said. I agree with it. In our global setting, sometimes we have the evidence and just in different settings. And so in understanding, can we apply the evidence that we have in other locations? Does it fit? Does it match the context? And so you might be able to, as you say, skip some of the retrospective and then prospective components, but then you also have to think about, you have to evaluate your context retrospectively and currently to understand if that intervention is going to fit. So a nurse-driven intervention might be great, but if you don't have any nurses how to do counseling, it's not going to work. And so you have to understand not only what the, the gap is, what the intervention is, but then also how the context is going to allow that intervention to work in the setting. And then how it can be sustainable, or if it is not potentially sustainable for that process and making it as pragmatic as possible allows that, that, that question to develop. So thinking about that as you develop, I think is incredibly important. Yeah, a concrete example. And I think that those are very good points and that you don't have to like spend years writing grants and, and so forth, like to answer important questions. Like when we did our hypertension text messaging study, it was like, I was frustrated. I saw so many people with high blood pressure there's plenty of people with high blood pressure who are there for other reasons. So I got undergraduates who the university paid me to take them. Like I, I got extra money. I got, I mean, it wasn't a lot, but I got enough money to buy a bunch of blood pressure cops. So, and then I was answering a feasibility question, which was the future state was like, somebody comes into the ER with an ankle sprain, turns out their blood pressure's jacked. When you discharge them, you don't do anything, but they get a blood pressure cuff and it starts texting them like, Hey, keep checking your blood pressure at home. And get in to see your PCP about this. You know, something that could be programmed that doesn't make the busy ED nurses or physicians have to focus a lot on it, but could help move somebody's blood pressure down. And our, our, our sort of feasibility study with the undergrads was like, we had to use research staff to hand the things out because we couldn't automate that to start. But how often do people actually text us back? And we just set like, a you know, the feasibility study was published in academic emergency medicine. And like, what were people's blood pressures? And do people keep listening to the messages and stay engaged? So that like, you know, we, we sort of set a bar of like, if more than half the people actually texted us back and we're still hypertensive, then it would be useful to do the follow-up study. And so then we, we sort of answered that 
because you know, I think there's sort of two types of questions you're answering in a clinical trial. It is, what do I need to do to make the patients better? That's one type of question. But the other type of question is, what do I need to know to do the study that will answer that last question, right? What like with, with without you know wasting my time, so to speak, or wasting the time of the patients? Because you, this is an opportunity cost. Like if you spend a lot of time doing something that's untenable, then that's too bad, right? If you if you had had a, a different idea that you had thought about maybe a little differently that you could really get an answer out of, because you know as is pointed out, there's a lot of answers out there we we, we need. I definitely think for that. So I, I really think. Thinking through the pathway of, you know, what is, how are people going to use this result? Will this change practice or will this lead to a change in practice? And, you know, if you don't see, if you can't really see that trajectory, then you have to kind of think about what, you know, kind of rethink how you're asking the question, maybe. Yeah, good, good point. Oh, we're going to say something, Dr. Singh. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate, remind, reminding myself of my first randomized control trial with a student where we were giving people a vest who were rode a motorcycle. We gave some, we didn't give others. We just watched to see if they wore it because it has good evidence, but are they even going to do it? And they didn't. So it was a really interesting step, even from a public health standpoint to know that like, okay, we're done, right? If they're not going to wear it, there's something else that's going on in behavior that we have to think about that just giving out our resources isn't going to work. Uh, so what a good segue, because I was just thinking about kind of the next question I wanted to ask was kind of, so we talked about some of the main points of randomized control trials being, you know, randomization, blinding whether you, you know, getting a control, whether that's a placebo or a standard of care, and even maybe making placebos is also maybe something. What I was hoping maybe each of you could share, like, your, the most prominent, like, lesson learned from your kind of history of, like, maybe something that was an utter failure that you thought was going to be really successful or a problem that you ran into that, that you've kind of think everyone else would maybe benefit from learning from. I think for me, in terms of wanting to get studies done and through the IRB in that initial phase is if you do do conventional wisdom, it's much easier to put things into the context of usual care versus usual care. So study things that, you know, are acceptable either way, you know, in terms of standard of care. And that really, really cuts down on the back and forth between the IRB and ethics and whether it's, you know, because you could say like, well, it's really randomized in general as to whether or not the, the patient will receive apneic oxygenation or they won't. That's up to the provider there. So we're kind of just following the, the course of standard of care. So if you could do that within your uh, IRB applications, that cuts down immensely, I think, on your time to uh, approval and initiation of the study. You know, when, when we sort of learned that, it was like an aha moment, like, ah, okay, there's a lot of stuff that we can study that isn't necessarily, you know, earth shattering, but can shed light on some of the conventional wisdom that we've been practicing over the past, you know, 50 years. Yeah, that's good advice. I, I, I'll second that one too. <laughs> what about you guys? I guess I could say that, you know, it's sort of an interesting, I'll just sort of give an interesting tension, right? And I don't, I don't know how this story ends because it's ongoing, but in the adult ice cap trial, when we were, when we designed it and got FDA approval, it was before the TTM trials came out. So we didn't, you know, based on the gu guidelines, everybody needed to be cooled that introduced a biologic constraint into our design. In addition, the evidence is if you're going to cool somebody, you do need to do it quickly because the, the brain doesn't like, you know, doesn't like to not be cooled quickly. At least, you know, the animal models suggest you need to get to a target pretty early. So we built a design feature. Of, so then how do you study something when you can't really have a control group? So we arrived at a dose response model and that ice cap will randomize or does randomize patients to a duration between six and 72 hours, hypothermic targeted temperature management after cardiac arrest. So it will not, so in terms of its later interpretation, there's not a control group per se, there is a curve. And if the curve is flat, if six and 72 and everything in between are all the same, then the inference from that is that there is no difference. It doesn't matter how, it, it doesn't matter, cooling doesn't matter because the people in the six hour group are really probably only cooled for about two hours because it involves the time that they they're getting down. But it gives us six hours to get consent. You know, it, it has all these sort of sort of features. It makes people get them cold quickly because that's also honoring the biology. But you know, when people look at it, when we publish it someday, they'll be like, this is weird. You know, when we did the pediatric study, because the evidence in the, the pediatric space was a little different maybe similar, but different. There was a one study in pediatric out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that had a, a non-significant p-value, 
but 20% of the kids who got hypothermic TTM did well and 12% who didn't, but you know, most, most PICUs didn't adopt 33 degrees as their practice. So in that study, the design is allowed to have a normothermic arm, but it may not put many patients there because if 48 is killing 24, in terms of the, the amount of cooling, then you know there's not really a good ethical reason to put a lot of kids on those shorter durations that aren't doing well. So that's a very, I don't know, sort of complicated situation of when you can't have a control, here's what you do. But I would agree, in most cases, there are a couple of usual care type interventions, right? Is it like, should I use cefepine or, or should I use zosin? You know, there's, you know, like those are the, the that's a relative, like you should use an antibiotic, right? Like, but, you know, maybe that, you know, to learn which of those would be a better first choice is a very low stakes question from the IRB's perspective. And I think the other thing that IRBs sometimes struggle with is low stakes decisions in sick patients, right? Like somebody's critically ill, is this a high risk study because they're critically ill? It's like, you know, giving KFOS packets or, you know, KCL packets, it's not a high stakes decision. Even even though it may, there, I mean, again, that's a sort of dumb example, but like, that's not a high risk decision. That's not a high risk study, even if it is in patients that have a high risk of mortality. So making sure that you make those those distinctions clear, is there a lot of incremental risk from what you're what you're assigning randomly? I think that that can that can help. Painting a really obvious picture to the IRBs can help. I would echo that. I think thinking through the ethical ramifications of what you choose and starting with this is what is happening right now. And this is where I think we're going, but how do I get the steps there to make sure that my patients are safe and that we've proven that that's happening. So I do adaptive, I have an, an adaptive trial right now and my advisory board wants me to continue the usual care arm, even though we've demonstrated that we've, we have effectiveness. And so we're uh, losing our minds, but they're worried, but that our next phases won't be compared to a usual care. So understanding, not everybody always understands the adaptive nature of your process. And then on top of that, once you've started to prove these things, you really have to think through the process. Okay, once we understand that third step, how is that going to compare to the first? Um, and laying out each of your steps and your thought process of improving care and pr improving the next process of what's happening um, and how you get there with appropriate randomization, with appropriate comparators to make sure you're really getting the right answer that you want. An another example that we did in our network, ironically, we designed it in the same conference room the same weekend in, or the same days in July of 2011 as ICECAP, except for we've already finished the study. It was the Established Status Epilepticus Treatment Trial, which is when somebody gets benzodiazepines and doesn't stop seizing in the emergency department, what do you give them? And there's three choices, but doing nothing wasn't a choice, right? Like, so, you know, the choices were levetiracetam acid phosphonitoin. Now you could argue there's a fourth choice, right? Like just put them on propofol and put them on mechanical ventilation. You know, we didn't give that as a choice because the idea was to stave off the need for prolonged mechanical ventilation and paralysis. So the study design was sort of this randomized play the winner type design where as the study went on, if one of these arms was doing better, unbeknownst to us, that, that arm would get more patients. So the study would be more efficient in terms of it would dedicate more patients to the best performing arm, fewer to the poor performing arms. And there was like a guardrails. If all of the arms suck, then we, the study was just going to end and be like, okay, none of these are really doing adequately. So you need to just maybe think about doing, uh, you know, just innovating all these patients like up front. So that was, you know, th the output of it was, these are the, these are the things. And in the end, it didn't show a difference between the three things, but I would say most people like the safety profile and ease of administration of levetiracetam the best. So it, it, it did, it did have that as a sort of useful, out, it, you know, it still provided a useful answer because there was a lot of controversy before as to which of those would, would be the best. And it did establish, based on the preclinical data, that you should be using a lot of levetiracetam if you're trying to stop active status epilepticus in terms of using 60 grams per kilogram, which people weren't really doing before that. So, so anyway, that that's another situation where sometimes we we have a lot of trial designs are sort of set up to compare two things, but 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 sometimes we actually have more than two things that that might be useful. And I think you know thinking about how you can you know answer more more than one question at once. It does make some things, it makes the math more complicated sometimes, but you know, if you were doing something that was like of a lower stakes thing, 
like there were three antibiotics you wanted to use, then you could, you know, probably do a large simple trial without even worrying too much about those. And then it, it could uh, give you an answer as to which of the three is the best. Yeah, definitely a good point. I'm going to go back to the audience and see if anyone has any more questions. I'm, I'm sure you guys are, are loaded with them. So what, uh, what else do you guys have as far as randomized trial kind of questions here? I have a question. I'm Stephanie. I'm a junior faculty at Vanderbilt. I start next week. I just came from VCU. So, well, I got to work with Lisa on IceCap and Boost and it was great fun. My question is, so I'm, I'm interested in going down the K pathway and I'm really interested in trial methodology and designing a trial as my K. For those of you that have I guess, enrolled in trials or design trials, both in the ED and outside of the ED, are there any nuances for enrollment and design from the ED or like things to a young investigator that you would tell when designing a trial for ED enrollment or design? And thanks, this has been really great. I would say everything you just said, you have to like sit and think about your context, right? It's going to depend upon the severity of your patient's the time that you have, the resources that you have, whether or not you can enroll your patients. So I, in my setting, in a global setting, I actually have to do health system type work because I can't just do it in the emergency department because of the way that the system is set up. So you have to know your system well and understand the context of the way that you practice and make sure that your trial matches the practice setting and the resources that you have. And then I think the fun part is then trying to figure out as we were talking about sort of multiple arms within a trial or adaptive trial components, what are what does the data show and what are the, the questions and the gaps? And then how do you start to think about answering with unique trial methodology, those gaps in particular, and hopefully multiple questions at a time, but in a very pragmatic nature. I think that's the fun part. During my K, I actually tried to teach myself and learn as much um, trial methods as possible because I think it was a great time to do it. And I think it's a constant learning process. So I don't think it ever ends. Yeah, I would say, you know, I haven't done a K or anything like that, but when I've thought about, you know, trial design and methodology, what I've tried to do to decomplicate my life is to study things that I can sort of get all of the data and all of the follow-up I need within that first 24 hour period. So like with Apox or with pre-oxygenation, it's hard to say 30 days later, they died because we didn't pre-oxygenate them appropriately, or they didn't receive apneic oxygenation, or they were lost to follow-up. You know, it's, it's hard to lose an intubated patient to follow-up because you're following them up within the next six to 12 to 24 hours in the ICU. You're not following them up in, in 30 days, 90 days, you know, 12 months. So, you know, you could really design simplified randomized control trials, depending on what the question is you're looking to answer and how rapidly you can get to that answer. So again, with airway stuff, you can get most of that information and, and the data for that answer within the six to 12 hours that patient is in the emergency department. You know, it's, you could even push it out to 24 hours and say like, ah, uh, you know, the the apneic period was too long or they desaturated and maybe that played into their, you know, their decompensation within the ICU. But even that is kind of like, all right, you know, there, you can make a debate either way. But, you know, when you're talking about things like ice cap or like we did shine, I was, I was one of the enrollers for, for shine. Like they had like 30 day follow-ups, 60 day follow-ups and, and, and a ton of, you know, data that needed to be collected in between. So that's, obviously a much more methodologically complicated trial to design than if you're looking at, all right, I want to see if I apply apneic oxygenation to my patient that needs to be intubated. Will they desaturate within, you know, the first three to five minutes of, of you know, their post-intubation period, right? I have full control over that. And, and the data collection within that is much simpler because it's just a simple data collection sheet that you could sort of incorporate into your airway checklist. So I think, you know, looking at questions in that sort of capacity helps you to determine, all right, how complicated is this design going to be and how much effort am I going to have to put into, into getting this study done? Is it going to be, you know, multidisciplinary? Is it going to be ICU, neurology, you know, dietary all involved in this? Like, obviously that's going to complicate your life, whether, you know, if it's just you in the emergency department, it makes it much easier. I'll give a sort of more jaded view, just, I guess, from a pragmatic perspective, that in the emergency department, we see people with stuff, right? Like they have presentations and symptoms. NIH is focused on people with diseases and there's different 
places you go for each type of disease. And the review process is, and the, the mission of the NIH is to improve the health of the US population. So in being able to use, you know, trial methodology is a tool to improving health for sure, but you do need to be able to really linearly connect the dots. HRQ has a couple Ks, but like the, the amount of Ks that, that are available through NHL and NINDS is sort of like, and, and probably NIAID is probably a billion times, well, maybe not a billion, but much, much higher. So I think, I think it's also, each of them had their own sort of quirks as to like what they like to see in Ks and so forth. I guess the, I guess, but I would say that the, you know, in, in other stuff that I do, and I apologize if I've rejected any of your papers before, but I'm a decision editor for Annals of Emergency Medicine. I'm also a meth stats reviewer for Annals of Emergency Medicine and Academic Emergency Medicine. So I see like a lot of research that comes in and, and I see some sort of common themes on it. And I think it's very, very true. There's a lot of clever ways to do really smart things with very limited resources. And there's a lot of clever ways. There's a lot of ways to do some super not so clever things with a lot of resources. But I, I think a common theme is it's just the, 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 the tension of the ethics, right? If somebody's in terrible pain, it's really hard to be like have a legitimate consent process with people, right? And those are the sorts of things. You just have to think of it from a practical perspective. When do you add in this sort of research procedure? Like, you know, we could use, I mean, again, I, I I, I, I did a stroke neurology fellowship. I, I am supportive of using stroke thrombolysis. We won't turn this to an, a, a, a discussion on that. But TNK is objectively like easier, cheaper, and like almost no chance it's better than TPA. Yet my institution still hasn't switched. It's supposed to happen like next week. But like, it's like, do you hate emergency department nurses? Like you're gonna make them like give this bolus, like, like put all this stuff in a pump and all this. It's like, no, I just, push this one drug for five seconds. So like, but if you think about it, if you had to do a randomized controlled trial up front where you're doing TPA versus TNK in the emergency department, that would be really hard because how do you get consent? You know, could you do that under exception from informed consent? I don't know. But so, so like that's, you know, so th those are parts of the challenges, right? You have a disease process that interferes with your ability to get consent. That can be a problem depending on the stakes of the disease. If it's, and, and then you also have the need to start treatments. So, and the fact that people get a bunch of other treatments. And I, I think Dr. Caputo's points are well taken. Desaturation is a surrogate for if they had damaged brain, you damaged it more. There's nobody who's on the, on, it's like, it's like cancer, right? Like nobody comes out like, I don't know, am I pro-cancer or, or, or con-cancer, right? Like everybody is, like nobody is like going to say that, a, you know, desatting patient is a good thing, but, you know, at the NIH level, people are going to, are going to want you to connect the dots to say like, you know, in TBI, a single episode of hype is, is associated with an odds ratio of two for not waking up and so forth. So, so again, you sort of have to, if you're using a surrogate marker, you have to connect the dots. The challenges are, you know, all the concurrent treatments, you know, fitting your research question into those, but I guess, I don't know. I mean, like, it, like, I know we want to make sure we have people who can answer other questions. I'm sort of interested in what exact area you're thinking of going into, because that may be, we may be able to give you a little bit more targeted advice with an idea, like a general idea as to like what you might want to study. Yeah, so I am, I'm going to be working with pulmonary critical care and the pragmatic critical cares trials group. So Matt Sendler and John Casey. So I imagine, Dr. Caputo, you work with them based on your discussion with Preoxy and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, I've worked with Matt and, and John. Uh, yeah, and then with the the space, and then my so probably somewhere in the RSI space potentially, versus my other background is in cardiac arrest, and my interest I, I train with Michael Kurz, and that's how I got involved in cardiac arrest research. And so we've actually been having some interest groups within the pragmatic clinical care research group and cardiac arrest. So trying to answer a pragmatic question from the ED perspective, or I guess ED and ICU, either in the RSI world or cardiac arrest world. Yeah, well, I mean, I would say you have no better mentors than, than Matt yeah. and John. I mean, and I, to tell you this, like I did the endow trial based off of Matt's fellow trial. And yeah. before I did the endow trial, you know, yeah. I, I reached out to Matt and I said, hey, I want to do this. Do you think we could hop on a call? I never met the guy before. Yeah. And the guy spent like two and a half hours on the phone with me, just telling me like the pitfalls of his research and everything. And, you know, 
you know, sent me a nice email after the and Dow came out and was just like, I'm really happy to see that this this came through. So for anybody on on that's listening that that feels like, hey, how do I get into RCT? Sometimes it's just reaching out to somebody that's doing them, being like, hey, I want to I want to do something similar. I guarantee you, nobody will say no to helping you and giving you advice. I heard John lecture at, at REST at AHA last year and reached out to him. And that's how I met them and developed a mentorship group before I even committed to joining Vanderbilt. I was like interviewing across the country, but I met them and they're incredible. And even though my my first love is cardiac arrest, I'm sort of wanting to learn the trial methodology, knowing that I might transition away from cardiac arrest, only hoping to bring it back to cardiac arrest later in life, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I have no doubt that that you will. I mean, you absolutely will. I think, you know, you'll you'll learn the ropes doing it uh, in the pragmatic airway group and then just bring it back to, to you know, cardiac arrest will be, you know, the second step. It'll be super easy for you. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll second. We'll have a lot of people who will be willing to help mentor you. And I'm sure even, you know, these guys on the call will be more than willing to have you reach out and kind of talk with them a little bit further. We do have just a couple more minutes left. Ooh, can, I, can I add just one little thing? Like one thing that you do want to make sure that maybe you look into, like if you're thinking about a trial, like rigorously look through like the literature to see if somebody's done it or if it's on clinicaltrials.gov first. Because if somebody's in the process of doing it, maybe they need help. Maybe they need another site. But but you, if somebody's already trying to answer the question, you know, it's not to say you might not answer it in a different way or a better way. There's not a need maybe for something in parallel. But but definitely that may be something that you want to try to look into as part of your planning program. Okay, sorry to jump that in. I just wanted to get results too, right? Like that's also a good plug for that too. So that people don't keep banging their heads doing the same thing that we already know doesn't work just because nobody published it. So I'm going to give everyone just like another minute or so to give any closing remarks or kind of recommendations they have for people interested. If you have, you know, a, a fancy catchphrase or, or something you'd like everyone to kind of take away from this. Uh, Dr. Satan, do you want to go first? Sure. I think one of the things that I've learned most by doing trials, but also research in general is one, talk to the, like, think about the context, understand the context and work with the team who's in the context. And then also create a team around you. And whether that's your research team who does the data collection or whether it's your analysis team who does a lot of the analysis components, we do far more innovative processes when we work together. And it's a lot of fun, especially when we're extroverted. So partner, reach out. I've had no one, as uh, Dr. Caputo was saying, no one has ever said, no, I won't help you. (laughs) And so reach out to others within both our networks, but also think outside of emergency medicine too, because the only way that we can get our processes to work is to work together as teams. Dr. Moyer, do you have any advice? No, I think I think that Dr. Staten said it said it very well. You know, be 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 humble, but be willing to to sort of reach out. If I don't write you back, it's probably because my email like got overloaded. Like, but keep trying to you know when there are people who are aligned. My favorite thing is my favorite thing to do is designing clinical trials, right? Like the middle phase where you're like I'm like oh god, 756 patients out of 1800. Like it's, that's sort of a mean phase. And then, and then like at the end, when you have all the results and you're writing things up, it's fun again, but like the design is really, really crucial though. Like answering a question that matters and thinking, thinking it through, thinking how you're going to use those results. I will just say like, you know, how making sure that, and making sure that you're designing something that can make you run away screaming, right? Like, like the vests, right? Like they, they, nobody wore the vests. Okay. We don't need to study the vests anymore. So have it, have it, if you, if you do something, sometimes people are like, you need to show that this is safe. It's like, how are you going to show a thrombolytic for stroke is safe with 10 patients, right? It's like, no, like you're, you're not going to estimate, you, you know, estimate a rate of 6% in 10 patients. Like, it's dumb, right? Like, so be sure that you're asking a question that you don't already know the answer to, but that you're answering a question that has, either way, you might be getting an answer that is useful, right? In my ice cap trial, if the line is flat, I'm happy. We've gotten a really important result. Like, if the line's up and there's a plateau and there's this place where we should start to be treating people, I'm really happy because we're, we're going to be able to, to give people an answer they can use. So I think similarly, you should have a pathway after your trial as to what you need to do next and what other people need to do next. So just make sure you think ahead as to what the output of it will be when done. Wonderful. And Dr. Caputo, any, any closing remarks or advice? Yeah, absolutely. I would say in my experience, there's been no downside to doing research. It's led to great friendships, great mentorships, my mentoring of people, amazing networking, and really keeping me on the cutting edge of what we're practicing in terms of evidence-based medicine in the emergency department. So I always tell residents, junior faculty guys, there's no downside to doing research. It might seem boring or it might seem time-consuming, but in the end, 
it is awesome and you learn so much and the friendships you make are just some of them are lifelong wonderful well i want to thank you all for your time and expertise we really had a great panel here with lots of diverse and, and expert kind of opinions here and I, I appreciate everybody's time and questions just a little plug for society of academic emergency medicine so that's a great place to get some of these networking relationships and meet people whether that's through the research committee or whatever kind of topic interest you have it, there's a great place to mentor I'm sure all these panelists will be more than happy to take any questions over email if you have any kind of follow-up questions. And I just want to thank everyone again for attending our research learning series here on the randomized controlled trials with the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so everybody. Much.